redoing again. So hopefully this works and it gets recorded. So I'm reading the the color of law and this is chapter 11. Looking forward and looking back. I'm going to wait until someone can hear me before I start reading again. You still still can hear me? We and can hear. I can hear. I was giving you thumbs up. Okay, cool. So I'll go back and delete the other recordings, but I do want to make sure I get it on record. So I was talking about how I was in Dallas and one of the community centers I've been working on for five years is being shut down. And also to a brother that I went to job call with when we were like teenagers and got kicked out together, literally is on Sherm and battling drug addiction and down bad. I bring him up and the community center up because sometimes when we read about history, past and present, we don't link it to the people who are still suffering today and we don't check on each other. And this is just a reminder, like, don't just listen to this space or read these books and, and just to be like knowledgeable and know more than someone. Like apply it to your material conditions, apply it to your people. You know, let it help you understand like how we got here and why we're here, but not to be complacent and to accept it, but to resist it and to dismantle it. The reason why I say that is because people like Calvin are counting on those of us who can't fight to fight. And I'm going to keep him with me as I read this book. And I encourage y'all to check on each other because, like I said, there's no way we can be all right in this system of white supremacy. So, again, I hope this goes through. This is Chapter 11, Looking Forward, Looking Back. From 1957 to 1968, Congress adopted civil rights laws prohibiting second-class citizenship for African-Americans in public accommodations and transportation, voting, and employment. Although not without challenges, these laws were effective. Okay. Any segregation in housing, however, is much more complicated. Prohibiting discrimination in voting in restaurants mostly requires modifying future behavior, but ending segregation of housing requires undoing past actions that may seem irreversible. President Kennedy's 1962 executive order attempted to end the financing of residential segregation by federal agencies. In 1966, President Lyndon Johnson pushed to have a housing discrimination bill passed, but in a rare legislative defeat, the Senate killed his proposal. Two years later, civil rights advocates tried again, and this time the Senate eked out by the narrowest of margins of Fair Housing Act that prohibited private discrimination in housing sales and rentals. Shortly after, pressured by national emotion following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in April 1968, the House of Representatives enacted the law for the first time since 1883, when the Supreme Court rejected the Civil Rights Act's ban on housing. Discrimination. Government endorsed the rights of African Americans to reside wherever they close, I'm sorry, wherever they choose and could afford. This law is now a half century old. You might think that 50 years would be long enough to erase the efforts of government promotion of and support for segregation, but the public policies of yesterday still shape the racial landscape of today. Shout out to Calvin. Where other civil rights laws have fallen short, the failures have been in implementation and enforcement, not in concept. Their design was straightforward. If African Americans were permitted to vote freely, their political power would be no different from that of others. If discrimination were prohibited in hiring, it would take some years for African Americans to gain comparable seniority, but once they did, so their workplace status would no longer be inferior. Once we prohibited segregation in hotels and restaurants, patients of any race could be served. Likewise, the segregation was abolished on buses, trains, passengers of both races could sit in empty bus seats the next day. The past had no structural legacy. legacy. We could use the same buses and trains and no gargantuan social engineering was needed to make the, the transition to integration. So that's full of shit. Again, this is a cracker who wrote this book. And I'm going, so someone had requested when I, uh, read like chapters, I want to say 10, for a list of 10 books that go along with this one, which I'll link and I'll make sure I'll reference like these spaces. But there are books that break down how all those things he mentioned that he said somehow were healed by outlawing segregation, That that's a whole lot. It is, sorry, it just is. And of course, we all know that because we're living in those conditions. So like I said, I'll create a list of 10 books that directly address everything he mentioned that was rectified and it wasn't and how it wasn't. 
Ending school segregation was much harder, but how to achieve it was clear. Districts could revise local school attendance boundaries so that children of either race could attend their neighborhood schools, and districts could upgrade the lower quality schools that African Americans had attended so that all facilities would be equal and otherwise. Certainly there was massive resistance from 1954, when the Supreme Court ordered the dismantling of separate black and white school systems, yet in principle, school desegregation in most locales was easy. Okay. Right there, I want y'all to talk to... Okay, so my dad was a part of the busing, like when they started busing kids to school. Again, when they... A lot of areas, if you ask people, especially in the South, where you say, okay, well, what happened during when they were doing, like, you know, desegregation? A lot of places were not even desegregated when the law was passed. It wasn't until some decades later, they literally just desegregated uh, Mississippi proms. I want to say 2006. Like, they literally still had segregated proms there. So, again, this guy and the way he writes it, he is a cracker. And it's wrong. And then also, too, my dad, right, he went, he was one of the ones bust. He talked about how violent it fucking was during that whole time. So I don't know what no problem means. Also, the black schools were not funded <laughs> at all. One person who has like such a great insight and is just a powerful speaker is Dancing Tree. And she talks to this a lot. She and her brother lived through this. And she talked about how their books came because they had to wait for the books from the white schools to get to their schools with piss and shit on it. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So again, listen to your elders, talk to your people and let them tell you how this shit really was. Certainly there was massive resistance after 1954 when the Supreme Court ordered dismantling of separate black and white schools systems. Yet in principle, um, sorry, yet in principle, school desegregation in most locales was easy. This fucking crack, I swear to God. (laughs) And if achieving it the next day was politically difficult, the time required should have been a matter of years, not decades. Unlike desegregated housing, desegregated schools require not undoing the discrimination that previous generations received, but only practicing integration going forward. As it has turned out, schools are more segregated today. This cracker. (laughs) I can't stand his pattering of writing. Like, it's like he'll tell you he'll be full of shit and then be like, well, you know, if I was to be honest, it's like, well, let's just be honest from junk. Let's just save some pages. (laughs) Sorry, y'all. It just pisses me off. As it has turned out, schools are more segregated today than they were 40 years ago. But this is mostly because the neighborhoods in which schools are located are so segregated. No. In 1970, the typical African-American student attended a school in which 32 percent of the students were white. By 2010, this exposure had fallen to 29 percent. It is because of neighborhood segregation that African-American students are more segregated in schools in states like New York and Illinois than they were are anywhere else. Throughout the country, not just in the South, busing of school children was almost the only tool available to create integrated schools because few children live near enough to opposite race uh, peers for any other approach to be feasible. I want to say, too, that what's currently going on with school systems around the country, black writers, radical black writers need to start documenting it now so that we won't have to go to books written by crackers who literally will confuse the shit out of you unless someone breaks down what they're saying, what's wrong, where they're off, all of that shit. So I hope people who, even if you've never written before, this is literally a call to action in the times we find ourselves that whatever talents you have, use it to make sure the truth is told and that people can use it to overthrow the system that is oppressing all of us. We're housing, okay, yet unlike the progress we anticipated from other civil rights laws, We shouldn't have expected much to happen from a Fair Housing Act that allowed African-Americans now to resettle in a white suburb. Moving from an urban apartment to a suburban home is incomparable, more difficult than registering to vote, applying for a job, changing seats on a bus, sitting down in a restaurant, even attending a neighborhood school. Residential segregation is hard to undo for several reasons. He lists, parents' economic status is commonly replicated in the next generation. So once government prevented African-Americans from fully participating, once, uh, let's see, parents, economic sales, African-Americans fully participated in mid-century free labor market, depressed incomes became, for many, a multi-generational trait. The value of white working and middle-class families, suburban housing, appreciated substantially over the years, resulting in vast wealth differences between whites and blacks that helped to define permanently our racial living arrangements. Because parents can bequeath assets to their children, The racial wealth gap is more persistent down through the generations than income differences. 
Another point he says for the reason why it was so hard. <laughs> we waited to we waited too long to try to undo it. By the time labor market discrimination abated abated sufficiently for a substantial numbers of African Americans to reach for the middle class, homes outside urban black neighborhoods had almost become unaffordable for working and lower class middle class families. Once segregation was established, seemingly race neutral policies reinforced it to make remedies even more difficult. Perhaps more pernicious has been the federal tax code's mortgage, uh, mortgage interest deduction, which increases subsidies to higher income suburban ho homeowners while providing no corresponding tax benefit for renters. Because de jour policies of segregation ensured that whites would more likely be owners and African Americans more likely be renters. The tax code contributes to making African Americans and whites less equal despite the code's uh, purportedly non racial provisions. Contemporary federal, state, and local programs have reinforced residential segregation rather than dismissed it. Federal subsidies for low income families housing have been used mainly to support those families' ability to rent apartments in minority areas where economic opportunity is scarce, not in integrated neighborhoods. Likewise, Developers of low-income housing have used federal tax credits mostly to construct apartments in already segregated neighborhoods. Even half a century after government ceased to promote segregation explicitly, it continues to promote it explicitly. Oh, I'm sorry. Even half a century after government ceased to promote segregation explicitly, it continues to promote it implicitly, implicitly every year, making remedial action more difficult. So those are the reasons that the author lists why it was so hard to for seg for desegregation and housing to work. Again, I'll list the 10 books that says otherwise. From the end of World War II until about 1973, the real wages and family incomes of all working and middle-class Americans grew rapidly, nearly doubling. African Americans, however, experienced the biggest growth toward the end of that period. In the 1960s, the income gap between them and white workers narrowed somewhat. The incomes of African American janitors and white production workers grew at the same pace. And the gap between them didn't much narrow, but African Americans, who previously would have been employed only as janitors, were hired as production workers, and they made gradual progress into better jobs in the skilled trades, at least in unionized industry. African Americans remain mostly excluded. However, from highly paid blue collar occupations to construction trades, for example, and most government jobs, teaching the federal civil I'm sorry, teaching the federal civil service, state and municipal government, but not in all. African Americans made progress. They were hired in city sanitation departments, for example, but rarely as firefighters. Overall, African Americans' income didn't take off until the 1960s when suburbanization was mostly complete. Real quick note, when we read these books written by Ofez and they tell us what success is, we, it is important that as black people seeking liberation that we have our own definition and vision of what success and liberation is so that we can read these books with intent and not get caught up on, oh, well, upward mobility is a sign of success. No, it is not. As we find ourselves today, we are literally in the same spot. And matter of fact, hold on real quick, y'all. All right. Matter of fact, in many areas, we find it much worse. So I would say, I just wanted to say that because he's going to put in this book, oh, success, progress. Again, if those don't relate to us as oppressed people as a success and progress, well, then our definition trumps his and any OFA, and that's important. From 1973 until the present, real wages of working and middle-class Americans all, of all races and ethnicities have been mostly stagnant. For those with only high school educations or perhaps some college, real earnings decline as production workers with unionized factory jobs were laid off and found employment in service occupations where the absence of unions meant wages would be much lower. Just as the incomes of all working-class Americans white and black began to stagnate, single family home prices began to soar. What does that sound like? That's literally today. <laughs> I Real quick, so he talks about production workers. Okay, I'm in Texas. I work in an oil field, right? I was a production technician until I got promoted. As a production technician, when you first started off, right? Again, when I started, uh, cost of living was a little bit, of course, lower than it is today. But everyone's uh, goal in Texas is to work in the oil field because that's where the money's at. Not so much today, because now their starting pay is actually lower than before with the cost of living going up higher. And we're finding that as more black people get access to these, do these jobs, either through P-TECH degrees or apprenticeship programs, 
that's when they literally start giving you less benefits. All of a sudden, the way they structure the 401k is mass diff- madly different where they take more, but you get little in retirement once you do. And then also your pay is less, drastically less. So again, we're describing something in the past that directly reflects the present. Again, that's why I say when he's talking about, oh, we made progress, how, if, we're, if I'm describing the same conditions I'm and we are living in. Just as in the incomes of all working class Americans, white and black began to stagnate, single family homes began to soar. From 1973 to 1980, the African-American median wage fell by 1%, while the average American house price grew by 43%. In the next decades, decade, wages of African-American workers fell by another percent, while the average house price increased yet another 8%. <laughs> By the time federal government decided finally to allow African-Americans into the suburbs, the window of opportunity for an integrated nation had mostly closed. In 1948, for example, Levantown homes sold for about 8000 or 75000 in today's dollars. Now, properties in Levantown without major remodeling sell for $350,000. That's a one-bath house and up. White working-class families who bought those homes in 1948 have gained over three generations more than 200,000 in wealth. Most African-American families who were denied the opportunity to buy into Levantown or into the thousands of subdivisions like it across the country remained renters, often in depressed neighborhoods and gained no equity. Others bought into less desirable neighborhoods. Vince Meriday, who helped build Levantown but was prohibited from living there, bought a home in the nearby almost all-black suburb of Lakeview. Yo, I'm sorry, I had to take a break because the brother built it and he couldn't even live there. And that's still true today. If you look at most people who built these new uh, subdivisions, a lot of them cannot even afford to live there. Sick shit that we just think is normal. It remains 74 percent African-American today. His relatives can't say precisely what he paid for his Lakeview house in 1948. But the Levantown being the least expensive, best bargain of the time, it was probably no less than 75,000 he would have paid in Levantown. Although white suburban borrowers could obtain VA mortgages with no down payment, Vince Meriday could not because he was African-American. He would have had to make a down payment probably about 20% or $15,000. One bath homes in Lakeview currently sell for $90,000 to $120,000. At most, the Meriday family gained $45,000 in equity appreciation over three generations, perhaps 20% of the wealth gained by white veterans in Levittown. Making matters worse, It was lower middle class African-American communities like Lakeview that mortgage brokers targeted for some prime lending during the pre-2008 housing bubble, leaving many more African-American families subject to default and foreclosure than economically similar whites. I just want to stop right there because last time I brought this up and I described how this still happens today, uh, people that I've talked to uh, are literally losing their homes because of this. And then I left it at that. And I, I was thinking as I was driving later on that day, I was like, well, shit, if you identify a problem, what have I done to like organize to solve it? And to be honest, nothing. So I am going to start gathering those people. And again, with, through like other information we have and how this is wrong and start organizing in a way to directly address how black people are being targeted. I'm in Houston. So that's where it's going to start for me and how they're being targeted by the same predatory loans that they supposedly said was illegal is still in effect today, and people are losing their homes at rapid rates right now as we speak. So I just wanted to call out that kind of self-criticism that sometimes I'll name a problem, but if I recognize a problem, I should do something towards it, and and I will. And posted here to the steps on I took and how I organized, what we did, and the steps and our strategy so that if anyone wants, I'll put in a free PDF format, and I'll put it in the library, the, the Pan-Africanist library, and then anyone can get it and hopefully apply it to their area. Of course, it's going to look different depending on where you're at, but at least you'll have like, you'll know like, okay, this is what they did in Houston, what worked and what didn't work. So it's going to take me a while to get that together, but I will get on that. 70 years ago, many working and lower middle class African-American families could have afforded suburban single family homes that cost about 75000 in today's currency with no down payment. Millions of whites did so, but working and lower middle class African American families cannot now buy homes for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And that's literally the average of how much homes cost in Houston, bro. It's sick and more without down payments of 20 percent or 70 percent. And again, these housing prices, because there's a lot of YouTube and get 
quick rich schemes that are promoting like buy a house, buy a house. What they don't tell you is that your mortgage isn't the only thing you got to worry about, especially in these loan contracts that they're targeting black people with, especially in Texas, is the read your fine print. It'll have like, let's just say they'll say your mortgage is fifteen hundred a month. The following year, though, is when all the fees apply that literally doubles it. And that's literally how people that I know are losing their homes right now. And after missing like one or two payments at that. With no down payments, millions of, oh, I'm sorry. In the Fair Housing Act, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited future discrimination, but it was not primarily discrimination, although this still contributed, that kept African-Americans Okay. Sorry, my phone. Uh, I had a phone call. It was primarily unaffordability. The right that was unconstitutionally denied to African-Americans in the late 1940s cannot be restored by passing a fair housing law that tells their descendants they can now buy homes in the suburbs. If only they can afford it. The advantage that FHA and BA loans gave the white lower middle class in the 1940s and 50s has become permanent. The reduction of discriminatory barriers in the labor market that began in the mid 20th century did not translate easily to into African-Americans upward mobility. Movement from lower ranks to the middle class in a national income distribution has always been difficult for all Americans. This reality challenges a fantasy we share that children born into low income families can themselves escape that status through hard work, responsibility, education, ambition, and little luck. That myth is becoming less prevalent today as more Americans become aware of how sticky our social class positions are. Again, what does that sound like? This is why we're hearing words like socialism and communism come up more in mainstream because that is the direct response to an oppressive system that is choking the life out of everyday people. Imagine that we lined up all American families in order of their incomes from highest to lowest and then divided that line into equal five groups. So basically in this next paragraph, unnecessarily, <laughs> he just goes through like what it would look like if it was equal and the most just word salad way possible. But so I'm going to say it very succinctly. <laughs> basically, he's saying if upward mobility worked and it, it was based on like how hard you worked, then your kids who would benefit off your hard work would be more would be higher than where you at. And it would keep going and it would be a constant shift. So if someone was lower class, then they would be middle class by, you know, the time their kids were come adults, their kids would be middle class. And if the people who were in middle class worked hard, they would be upper middle class. And that's how this would work. Again, not true. That is not how capitalism works. But <laughs> that's another book for a goddamn other time. So I'm going to go on reading. But yes, we need to talk about these things because you need to understand the system. So one, oppressed people can stop blaming themselves for something that's being imposed upon them. And two, to not make it into something that can't be defeated. Anything created can be defeated. Everything has an expiration date. And the power is with the people at all times, which is why you're constantly being propagandized that you are weak and you have no power. That is absolutely false. If the people were to seize their power and destroy the state and demand their liberation, it can't happen. This is why when we see other movements of liberation across the global South, they downplay it to us. They tell us, oh, that's not legitimate. Or they haven't met the metrics to be seen as liberation movements. What's going on in West Africa needs to be studied by black people here in America. And we should be talking about it a lot more. Because, again, this is a time, every time is a good time for liberation. But where we find ourselves at now, I really think if we don't take advantage of it, we will lose a lot of ground. And I think we can gain a lot of ground if we organize as though we're fighting for our fucking lives. <laughs> Honestly, that's my plan for the next nine months anyway. My bad, y'all. Let me go back to reading. <laughs> median white family income is now about 60000 while median black family income is about 37000 about 60% as much. You might expect that the ratio of black to white household wealth would be similar, but median white household wealth assets minus liabilities is about 134000 while median black household wealth is about 11000 less than 10% as much. Not all of this Enormous difference is attributable to the government's racial policies, but a good portion of it certainly is. I'll put it all in the system because that's exactly what produced it. <laughs> Don't play with me. It's like they be it's, it's crazy because he'll talk. Right. And of course, he'll be stating facts that can be that can be verified. But it's like he's trying to put it in a very, you know, kind, open minded way. Like, guys, it's not that bad. You know, if we just write it correctly on paper, it could get better. Fuck that. 
Because, again, we're dying out here. Like there, like I said, shout out to my homeboy, Calvin, who right now is struggling with drug addiction because of the system he lives in. Like this is some sick shit that we've gotten too normalized. Like driving down the street and seeing people on the corner begging for food should not be a normal thing. That should invoke a rage in you to say, hold on, this motherfucker is hungry and he has to beg or he or she got to beg for a fucking sandwich. And we're just OK with that. And we're just waiting for the light to turn green so we can keep driving. This is sick shit. This is a sick way to live. This isn't living. An equal opportunity society with respect to wealth would operate similar to an equal opportunity society with respect to income. No matter how wealthy, wealthy your parents would have an equal chance as an adult. <laughs> this guy. Of ending up anywhere in the national wealth distribution. But nearly half, 41% of children born to parents in the least wealthy fifth of American families remain in the lowest quintile as adults. Basically, he's saying that if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor. And that's generational, which means if you are born in the lower class, more likely than not, your kids, 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 kids for forever and a day will always be poor and exploited. That's the thing. Like someone profits off you not being able to afford housing or you having to work four or five jobs to be able to finally afford a house that is way out of your budget, but the only housing you can get to so that you could then default and they can sell it again at another profit to exploit another family and then another. So yes, we have to start when we describe poverty is not a happen sense. It is a violent mechanism of capitalism and white supremacy. As is true with income, African-Americans are also less mobile in wealth than whites. Fewer than one fourth of African-American adults whose parents were in the bottom wealth quintile made it make it to the middle wealth quintile. Nearly twice as many 42 percent white adults whose parents were in the lowest make it to that far. Since African-Americans were mostly prevented by government racial policies from owning single family homes in the suburbs, it is not surprising that this would be so. Again, he only mentions like the government's part in it. But remember, in damn nearly every chapter, it made mention of incidences where even where segregation was made illegal, the crackers in that area worked to make sure black people could not get housing in that area. So, no, it wasn't just a government thing. It was every facet of society, including working class whites who worked to make sure that black people stayed in an exploited class and out of housing. This difference becomes especially significant in the white families are more often able to borrow from their home equity if necessary to weather medical emergencies, send their children to college, retire without becoming dependent on those children, aid family members experiencing hard times, or endure brief periods of joblessness without fear of losing a home or going hungry. If none of these emergencies consume their savings or home equity, families can bequeath wealth to the next generation. Real quick, Black people do not have that option. <laughs> Man, it's, it's just hearing it is wild, because I know too many people who are like, if they get sick, they're not going to the hospital. They cannot afford it. In 1989, the most recent year for which such data are available, 6% of black households inherited wealth from the previous generation. Of those who inherited wealth, the average inheritance was 42,000. Four times as many white households, 24%, inherited wealth and the average, inherited what, the average inheritance was $145,000. In that year, 18% of black households received cash gifts from parents who were still living in an average of $800. About the same share of white holes received such gift, but the average amount, 2,800, was much greater. This, too, is a consequence of government's 20th century racial policy in housing and income. Let me grab some water real quick. And on these recordings, y'all are going to hear me say it about 50, 11 million times. The only logical solution is literally revolution. One reason low-income African-Americans are less upwardly mobile than low-income whites is that low-income African-Americans are more likely to be stuck for multiple generations in poor neighborhoods. Patrick Sharkley, a New York University sociologist, analyzed data on race and neighborhood conditions and reported his findings in a 2013 book, Stuck in Place. He defines a poor neighborhood as one where 20% of families have incomes below the poverty line. In 2016, the poverty line was about 21,000 for a family of three. In a neighborhood where 20% of families have incomes below poverty, many more families are likely to have income just above it. Notwithstanding the government's official poverty line, most of us would consider families to be poor if they had incomes that were below twice that line. 42,000 for a family of three. The federal government itself considers school children whose family incomes are nearly twice, 185% the poverty line, to be too poor 
to pay their own lunches without subsidy. Real quick about school lunches. So I just, whenever I bring up school lunches, I like to uh, remind people that you can go to your local school and pay the debt of school lunch if it's in, like, if you have the resources to do so. I would encourage people just for fun, if you have, like, neighbors that you are cool, which we should be, we should know our neighbors. That's important. But your friends or your neighbors or people you're close to, if y'all do a crowdfund to get these kids' school lunches paid off, we that's the least we can do to make sure these kids have meals. Because I remember when I was a kid, bruh, the only time I ate is when I went to school. And if I didn't have the money, they did not have no problem telling me I'm not getting lunch. <laughs> so, yes, let's start thinking of little, little things like that. It's not even little. That's major, especially to someone like me. Because someone paid my lunch without even knowing that it was me directly getting impacted. I'm able to be just as hateful of a, of a face as I am today. <laughs> Invest. <laughs> but all jokes aside. <laughs> no, don't give no tear, Neo. These old faces don't deserve no love. I'm literally reading down the list of how we're cut out of resources. If you want to share a tear for an old face, get it together. <laughs> but no, real talk, though. Consider that. Think of your local school and say, man, I wonder if I can put $100 towards lunch or something. Or even if it's just 50, whatever you got, I, I encourage y'all to do that because kids like me benefit when you do. He defines a poor neighborhood as one, I'm sorry. He finds that the young African-Americans from 13 to 28 years old are now 10 times as likely to live in a poor neighborhood as young whites. 66% of African-Americans compared to 6% of whites. He finds that 67% of African-American families hailing from the poorest quarter of neighborhoods a generation ago continue to live in such neighborhoods today. But only 40% of white families who lived in the poorest quarters of neighborhoods a generation or so still do. 48% of African-American families at all income levels have lived in poor neighborhoods over the last two generations, compared to 7% of white families. If a child grows up in a poor neighborhood, moving up and out to a middle class area is typical for whites, but an aberration for African-Americans. Neighborhood poverty is thus more multi-generational for African-Americans than it is for whites. I'm sorry, and more episodal, episodic for whites. The consequences of being exposed to neighborhood poverty are greater than the consequences of being poor itself. Children who grew up in poor neighborhoods have few adult role models who have been educationally and occupationally successful. Their ability to do well in school is compromised from stress that can result from exposure to violence. They have few, if any, summer job opportunities. Libraries and bookstores are less accessible. There are fewer primary care physicians. Fresh food is harder to get. Airborne pollutants are more present, leading to greater school absence from respiratory illness. The concentration of many disadvantaged children in the same classroom deprives each child of the special attention needed to be successful. All these challenges are added to those from which poor children suffer in any neighborhood. Instability and stress resulting from parental unemployment. Fewer literacy experience when parents are poorly educated and more overcrowded living arrangements than the, I'm sorry, living arrangements that offer few quiet corners to study and less adequate health care all of which contribute to worse average school performance and as a result, less occupational success as adults. So all those things he listed is very much true, but I also want to talk about the violence in the school systems that the kids also have to face on top of all this shit. Again, the, the presence of SOR officers, which is just cops that they put in the school to police kids. You're walking to homeroom and you got to see a fully armed police officer like you're in a jail cell. And you committed no crime than being born black and trying to go to school to learn how to read. And we think this shit is fucking normal. <laughs> Certainly some children overcome these difficulties. They shouldn't fucking have to. But the average child living in a poor household is less likely to escape poverty as an adult. And the average child living in a poor household in a poor neighborhood is even less likely to do so. The cycle can be broken only by a policy as aggressive as that which created ghettos and concentrated poverty in the first place. So among the many things I disagree with this cracker about, no, the only way to get out of this is literally to dismantle capitalism because everything he describes is literal capitalism, how it functions. This isn't mistakes by the system. This is a system working as it intended. Because after, I'm sorry, because Americans vary greatly in their economic and social circumstances, any government program will affect different Americans differently, even if on its face, the program treats all alike. A sales tax, for example, applies equally to all, but will be more of a burden to a lower income consumer than to higher income ones. The legal jargon for this is that it has a, a dis, I'm sorry, I lost my place. The legal jargon for this 
is that it has a disparate impact on different groups. In a society where everyone's situation is different, de uh, desperate impacts are unavoidable, but we can try to minimize them. In the case of sales tax, by exempting grocery purchases. Once reserve segregation was established, African Americans and whites were not affected similarly, but subsequent racial neutral policies. Real quick, too, I know many of y'all know, but being poor is fucking expensive. That's another thing they don't they don't harp on enough. Being poor is so fucking expensive. Like for shoes, for example. If you can only afford the the cheap shoes that were poorly made, you have to keep rebuying those shoes because they tear apart easily. Like that shit that that adds up. Like everything that you have access to as a as someone uh you know designated to poverty is all shit that's not meant to last at all, including the houses. Like if you look at the way housing is built today in America, they are literally built to deteriorate on purpose so that you have to keep going to Home Depot and buying expensive shit like lumber that keeps going up every fucking year. That makes it damn near impossible to keep your house up. Y'all, y'all already know I'm a communist, so <laughs> I'm be shitting on capitalism all throughout these little spaces. Just letting you know. Once this year segregation was established, African-Americans and whites were not affected similarly, but subsequent race neutral policies. The Fair Housing Act prohibits housing programs who who disparate impact on African Americans reinforces their segregation unless the programs have a legitimate purpose that cannot be accomplished otherwise. But the Fair Housing Act does not prevent dis, dis, I'm sorry, disparate impacts from others, non-housing programs that build on pre-existing residential patterns. Unlike the activities that compromise the zero segregation, these programs need not have the intent of harming African Americans, although sometimes they may, but they do harm nonetheless. <laughs> I'm going to finish reading his paragraph, but what you're hearing is apologia, just so y'all know. Several seemingly race-neutral programs have reinforced the disadvantages of African-Americans that were initially created by race-conscious housing policies. Okay. See, that's, that's why sometimes research and history can be so exhaustive, because you have to be discerning like this. So he goes on with this apologia, saying, like, basically, these laws are put in place with a good heart. Remind you, in the previous chapters we read, he literally states that they were not. He's like, nah, they were put in place because we wanted uh, Black people to be oppressed. You'll see him flip-flop like this all throughout the book. Again, that's why it's, it's good to keep in mind who the author is. Their intentions are not the same as ours. So, again, let's keep going. Along with the mortgage interest deduction, another policy that on its face is race neutral but has discriminatory effect is our national transportation system. We have invested heavily in highways to connect commuters to their downtown offices, but comparatively little in buses, subways, lightweight, light rail to put suburban jobs within reach of African-Americans and to reduce their isolation from broader community. That's another example in which this cracker flip flops, because in the previous chapter, he talked about rightfully that how highways were built to demolish and displace African-American housing and African-Americans. Like he goes into detail and he cites like the ordinances, the laws, the, the businesses, the mayors and everyone involved in who did it. Literally in this chapter, he's like, oh, they built it so they can get to work. <laughs> Crackers, I swear to God. But yeah, just wanted to let y'all know. Uh, let's see. And then he, so he does accurately state how, he does accurately state how like African-Americans were kept on the outskirts farther away from factory jobs. So that'd be more difficult for them to get to work. Adding just another burden on compounded burden of just trying to exist in a fucking oppressive system that is choking the life out of people. Yet we keep trying to rationalize it. <sighs> Burn it down, y'all. Although in many cases, urban spur, although in many cases, urban spurs of the interstate highway system were unconstitutionally routed to clear up you know what? Let me just keep reading what this crack is saying. <laughs> Although in many cases, urban spurs of the interstate highway system were unconstitutionally routed to clear African-Americans away from white neighborhood and businesses. That's why I don't understand why he flip flops so much. He'll say one thing and then say, well, you know, it's such a waste of time. Just go for the juggler, my guy. And that was not the system's primary purpose. And the decision to invest limited transportation funds in highways rather than subways and buses has a, a disparate impact on African-Americans. Also, it was on purpose. Like there's, I don't know if y'all looked around y'all neighborhoods and some cracker neighborhoods over here, they don't have sidewalks and they do that on purpose because they know those people can afford cars. Most of them have more than two cars and they don't want, they, they say it, they literally say it. They do not want black people to be able to walk in their neighborhoods, which is why a lot of the times these areas, too, these white areas do vote to not have bus routes that go near their neighborhoods too. 
So a lot of these things that we were like experiencing today, they're not leftovers from segregation. They're literally people currently alive today, breathing. We keep saying, oh, we will die out with old age. No, the fucking won't. <laughs> like it benefits them. So the people of today are literally going to their, uh, their voting. They're picking politicians that align with these same interests that benefited their parents and their grandparents. Transportation policies that affected the African-American population in Baltimore illustrated those followed, followed throughout the country. Over four decades, successive proposals for rail lines or even a highway to connect African-American neighborhoods to opportunities have been scuttled because finances were short and building expressways to serve sub suburbanites was a higher priority. And suburbanites is just crackers. Isolating African-Americans was not the state purpose of Maryland's transportation decisions, though there also may have been some racial motivation. Again, the flip-flop. In 1975, when Maryland proposed a rail line to connect suburban and Arundel County, I'm, I'm probably saying that wrong, in downtown Baltimore, White suburbanites pressed their political leaders to oppose the plan, which they did. These crackers are sick. A review by John Hopkins University researchers concluded that the residents believed that the rail line would enable poor and inner city blacks to travel to the suburbs, <laughs> steal residents' TVs, and then, turn in, <laughs> and then return to their ghettos. Literally, it says this in quotes. I'm chuckling not because this shit is funny, but... Literally, if you go and you listen to city council uh, meetings that are online and a lot of times on their websites, these old phase are literally saying this verbatim today. <laughs> Maryland State Transportation Secretary stated that his office would not force a transit line on an area that clearly does not want it. Failing to explain how he balanced the desire of a white suburban area that clearly does not want it with the desires of urban African-Americans who needed it. And 40 years later, little has changed. In 2015, Maryland's governor canceled a proposal, a proposed rail linked to Baltimore's west side black neighborhood, saying the funds were needed for highway improvements. So they were denied a rail service that black people needed in Baltimore in 2015. And Baltimore is important because there is an activist named Samira Lee that I hope y'all look up. She works on food deserts out there. When Baltimore's water... Um, they had a water problem where there was arsenic, I believe, that was found in the water or some contaminant to which they, it was not safe to drink the water. She was one of the ones who organized water deliveries, not only for people who can make it with cars to pick up water, but she also made sure to transport it, transport it to um, the elderly. And we know that because uh, along with Nitra, Jet, Ms. Crea, Tani, and Antonia, uh, those uh, help gather funds and donations and the pallet of water that also went to Jackson, there was pallets of waters that were donated to Baltimore. So it's important that to understand like, yo, there's people working on this now, but shit, individuals can only do so much. And that's how we exhaust the good people around us. Like the less everyone does, the more the few people who decide to do it have to do. And that is exhausting. And they get worn out easily. And a lot of them just don't recover. And that's not fair. We can do better. We honestly can. 40 years later, little has changed. In 2015, Maryland's governor canceled a proposed rail link to Baltimore's west side black neighborhood, saying the funds were needed for highway improvements. The, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund then filed a complaint with the U.S. Government of Transportation, claiming that Maryland's priority for highways over mass transit had a desperate impact on African-Americans. The case was still pending when the Obama administration left office. Let me get water real quick because I'm running my whole mouth. All right. Actions of government and housing cannot be neutral about segregation. They will either exacerbate or reverse it. Without taking care to do otherwise, exacerbation is more likely. Federal government now operates two large programs to address the housing crisis faced by the poor and near poor, most of whom in many metropolitan areas are African-Americans. Without an intent to do so, each program has been implemented in a manner that deepens racial segregation. One, the low-income housing tax credit subsidized developers whose multi-unit projects are available for low-income families. The other, housing choice vouchers, probably known as Section 8, subsidizes families' rental payments so they can lease housing that they would not otherwise be able to afford. In the tax credit program, communities can veto developers' proposals something that officials in middle-class areas don't hesitate to do. Many policymakers urge developers to build in already segregated neighborhoods in the hope, usually a vain one, 
that their projects will revitalize deteriorated areas. Developers themselves also prefer to use tax credits in low-income neighborhoods because land is cheaper and it's easier to market new apartments to renters in the immediate vicinity. There is less political opposition to additional housing for minorities and lower income families. These conditions ensure that the tax credit, the tax credit projects will have a desperate impact on African-Americans, which means, um, what do you call it, negative impact, reinforcing neighborhood segregation. Analys an analysis of all tax credit unions nationwide completed through a 2005 found that about three-fourths were placed in neighborhoods where poverty rates were at least 20%. In the Section 8 program, landlords in most states and cities can legally refuse to rent to tenants who use housing vouchers, although a few jurisdictions prohibit such discrimination. The voucher amount is usually too small to allow for rentals in middle-class areas. A family that receives a voucher may find that the only way to take advantage of it is to move to a neighborhood even more segregated than the one where they are already living. As a result, few families with children who use Section 8 vouchers rented apartments in low poverty neighborhoods in 2010, while over half rented in neighborhoods where the poverty rate was 20% or more, including some who rented where poverty was extreme, 40% or more. Where vouchers are used to rent suburban apartments, these apartments are frequently in segregated enclaves within otherwise middle class suburbs. One of the books I'm going to put on the 10 recommended readings that go along with this one is called How Affirmative Action Was White. Uh, that is, that's a good book that also covers in more detail some of these things. In 2008, in conclusion, com I'm sorry, Inclusive Community Project, ICP, a Dallas civil rights group sued the state of Texas, claiming that the operation of the tax credit program had a, a, a negative impact on African Americans, violating the Fair Housing Act. In the city of Dallas, 85% of all tax credit units for families were in census tracts, where at least 70% of re residences were minority. The ICP have been attempting to promote racial integration in the Dallas area by helping African-American families with Section 8 vouchers find affordable apartments in predominantly white neighborhoods. But it was impeded because so many of the tax subsidized family housing developments approved by the state of Texas were in heavily minority income areas. I just want to harp on real quick when we read stuff like groups, black groups who tried to help black people get housing. It's not that because they wanted them to live next to whites. That wording pisses me off. As it was just described, uh, the areas in which black people were made to live in, that they were only allowed to rent or buy in these areas, were so bad. I mean, you're talking about no uh, adequate plumbing. Sewer drainage from suburban neighborhoods would go into the black areas. You're talking about living in just hell. And so what black people were trying to get is what they deserve, access to good housing. But that was only reserved for whites. So just keep that in mind when you hear me say that. That is not, it's, uh, integration is not about being next to old face. It's about getting adequate housing that any human being deserves, and it's a human right. In June 2015, the Supreme Court ruled in, in the ICP case that the disproportionate placement of subsidized housing in neighborhoods that have been segregated by past government policies could violate the Fair Housing Act, even if the placement was not intended to intensify segregation. But the opinion written by Justice Anthony Kennedy also allowed that placing subsidized units to support the revitalization of deteriorating neighborhoods could also be legitimate. Basically, that cracker tried to say <laughs> that, well, if we build black housing or housing to black people in bad areas, that could help that area. It's like, that's not what the result is. And you know that. You dirty ass snow roach. So it is not evident how much of a nationwide push towards desegregation will result from the ICP case. Gentrification of, pro of private housing in urban areas, redevelopment projects and highway routing have forced low income and minority families to search for new accommodations in a few inner ring suburbs that are in transition from white to, uh, I'm sorry, white, my, I'm messed up y'all, my bad. Oh, okay. Gentrification of private housing in urban areas, redevelopment projects and highway routing have forced low income and minority families to search for new accommodations in a few inner ring suburbs that are in transition from white to majority minority. So I want to touch on this. I, I'm, I'm going to say that this is me just sitting and meditating on the conditions of the world, right? So I was thinking about tiny homes, tiny homes. Now, when tiny homes was getting really popular and shit, I thought about it. I was like, okay, so maybe this can be something that could be used for people who don't have access to housing, a little bit more affordable, something I can crowdfund for. What I started noticing, though, and what I was thinking about, I was like, wait a minute. If we think about times of segregation in which 
we were kept like three families to a house because we weren't allowed uh, access to housing that was reserved and built for white folks. And even though they were empty, would not sell to us, but will only like regulate us to an area that only has say 15 houses. And then, you know, you have all these new families coming to work in the factories because of the war. And that's where the jobs were at. Now I have to double up in housing. What I'm trying to say is I find it very peculiar and I'm going to sit more and, and write and research about this, that tiny homes are being pushed as like some answer to houselessness and also saying like, oh, lighten your carbon footprint. The, the, the shit that comes from capitalism and white supremacy, they oftentimes tell us it's us that we need to fix, like like, uh, like climate crisis and like the way the environment is polluted. Military industrial complex po- is responsible for a lot of the pollution, but yet they would tell you to drink out of a, like a certain kind of straw and that's supposed to make a dent. Shit like that pisses me off because we buy into it because we're hit from all sides so we don't have time to sit down and think. What I'm trying to bring up about this tiny homes things is that it's like they're kind of getting us used to being in very small cramped quarters, but using like a way of saying like, oh, well, this is new and trendy and, you know, you're lightening your carbon footprint. Meanwhile, if you look at the pricing of those tiny homes, they have gone up exponentially. It's goddamn damn, damn nearly a house, which is crazy because if you've seen tiny homes, a lot of them are, are smaller than 500 square feet. I don't know. There's things I think about, y'all. But anyway... It's like a new way of creating like mobile ghettos and temporary housing, but making it seem like it was our choice and that is something we wanted. And those tiny homes and why temp- and that's temporary housing is because if you think about it, right, especially in places like New Orleans where and in the South period where humidity is high, a lot of these t- tiny homes are accumulating mold and getting people sick who live in them. And then two, depending on where you live, whether it's Hurricane Alley, Tornado Alley, all of that shit, n- none of these tiny homes can withstand that. So I find, it partic- I find it peculiar that it's being marketed towards poor people saying like, hey, you can't afford those big houses. Well, just get you a tiny home. Here's a cute little YouTube video that'll, you know, make it fun and literally ushering us into the same conditions that existed in this book that we talked about. When the tax credit and Section 8 program subsidized the movement of low income families into such suburbs and not into predominantly middle class ones, they contribute to segregation. Ferguson, Missouri, out of St. Louis, is such a place when the Section 8 and tax credit programs failed to offer opportunities to settle throughout the St. Louis metropolitan area, they contributed to Ferguson's transformation from an integrated to a predominantly minority and increasingly low income community. You know, rest in power to uh, Mike Brown. Jeez. Civil rights advocates and local. Yeah, civil rights advocates and local housing officials face a difficult conundrum. The ongoing income stagnation of working class families and the growing distance between job opportunities and affordable housing makes the need for subsidized housing more pronounced. Government officials can satisfy more of that need by using scarce Section 8 funds and supporting tax credit developments in segregated neighborhoods where rents and land are cheaper, where white middle class voters place fewer hurdles in the way. In the long run, however, African Americans will be harmed more by the perpetuation of segregation of my continued overcrowding and inadequate living space. Neither is a good alternative, but short-term gains may not be worth the long-term cost. And that's the end of the chapter. I just want to say that too, I'm going to be working on is because I keep saying like, you know, there's another way, but we don't, you don't, people will be like, okay, so what is the other way? So I'm going to do my best to compile as many like resources as possible, just in a thread, but then also too to like break it down so that you can digest it that there are alternatives to getting housing and that, but we would have to shift like a major shift in the way in which we view housing. That is not because he says, Oh, we can fix this. If we just work within the system, the very same system that created the problem. Assad already told us you cannot use the master tools to destroy that master's house. That's not how that fucking shit works. So again, I will make that thread of 10 books that relate to this uh, book. But then also, too, I'm, I'm working on creating like PDFs in which break down alternative ways and groups that have approached these problems and how it can work for us if we organize on mass scale behind it. So that was chapter 11. Um, I'm going to try to knock out chapter 12. I still have two more hours to drive to get to Houston. So hopefully when I get there and, you know, chill out a little bit, I'll be able to knock out chapter 12 because I really want to finish this book so that we can read Blood in My Eye. Because if y'all think I'm showing my whole black communist gay ass on this... When I read George Jackson, y'all, y'all don't understand. <laughs> it's going to be, yo, man. Anyway, y'all take care. Please check on each other. Shit is crazy out here. It's not our fault. 
but the power is with the people and y'all take care.